the matter radiation uh, equality. And uh, this happens at a, uh, a, a redshift, or uh, roughly uh, the ratio of a uh, scale factor of uh, A over A naught, the current version uh, of the scale factor, of about 1 over around 3,500. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, uh, this is about. 50 kilo years uh, after the Big Bang. And then uh, shortly uh, after that, there was the uh, uh, epoch where the temperature goes down to, at this point, around a quarter of an electron volt. Uh, and at this point, there just aren't enough uh, 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 fast-moving electrons uh, to uh, uh, maintain equilibrium in the process where electrons and protons are maintaining equilibrium backwards and forwards with this process. So at this point, the electrons and uh, uh, protons combine to form neutral hydrogen, and because We've removed all the other charged stuff in the game before this point. The universe uh, after this is almost completely neutral. There's uh, no uh, free charges around. And so these uh, photons that are uh, left over here free stream uh, all the way, uh, or all, of the, all the photons left in the game free stream all the way until uh, they uh, reach us today. Okay? So there's a, a decoupling of uh, this, uh, this process. Um, okay. So there's no sort of uh, uh, Thomson scattering type processes where gamma plus some charged particle uh, you know, scatters off to gamma plus charged. This is hugely suppressed because there's just none of these guys around. And so uh, in this way, at about a redshift factor of 1 over 1,100, we get this uh, epoch where the photons free stream uh, completely. And we get a snapshot of what the uh, bath of photons looked like at this uh, time period uh, we call recombination. OK. And so these photons go on to free stream and uh, we can now get a look at a map of uh, what these photons look like today after they've uh, propagated uh, through the universe until we, with our telescopes, uh, take a snapshot of all of them and we get a map of the sky of uh, what these photons look like. And we can make uh, a picture like this that represents uh, the uh, 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 temperature of those photons as they reach us. Okay. And when we uh, look at this, this is not the raw temperature. This is the, the temperature with the average temperature subtracted. So these are only the fluctuations in the temperature. The CMB itself is a near-perfect black body. With a average temperature of about 2.5. 7.3 Kelvin. And then if we uh, look at the uh, amplitude of temper temperature fluctuations uh, about this average, then we find that delta T over T bar, sort of rough, the rough scale of the amplitude of these uh, uh, fluctuations in the temperature, are on the order 
of 10 to the minus 5. So very, very small uh, temperature fluctuations about uh, the average temperature. And so uh, we call these you know, hot and cold spots, uh, even though uh, they are not very different in temperature. And so in this picture, we're looking at uh, the uh, hot and cold spots in terms of uh, uh, where the color coding is in uh, micro Kelvin, so from minus 300 to 300. So that encodes those, uh, those variations, okay? And these hot and cold spots are, are our uh, earliest uh, uh, evidence neglecting gravitational waves, uh, which we'll maybe we'll talk about uh, uh, later on and maybe the last lecture, uh, of those initial conditions that we were talking about in the previous lecture, imprinted after uh, some sort of evolution onto cosmological correlators. And so now the cosmological correlators in this picture are precisely this map uh, of these hot and cold spots, okay? So we can take a look at this and we can calculate uh, what these uh, correlators are from the data, yes? Okay, and so let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, how we might uh, uh, think about how this map uh, takes place. What, uh, what is the way that we evolve these uh, initial perturbations onto uh, the observables here, okay? Now, uh, we're going to start off uh, making an approximation uh, about the kinds of uh, fluctuations that we have. We have some perturbations that are seeded by the initial conditions that will evolve. And so we have to uh, make some assumption about uh, uh, what characterizes uh, those perturbations. And we will assume that they are adiabatic, okay? And we'll talk about uh, what this means uh, in a moment. Roughly, uh, it uh, corresponds to perturbations that are isentropic, that carry the same uh, entropy density uh, across all of the different species uh, that are associated uh, with these perturbations. Uh, but what's going to be important for us is uh, uh, what this means is that all of the perturbations in all of the different kinds of species uh, that we have, the, uh, the, the photons, the uh, uh, baryons, et cetera, can all be uh, encoded in a, a single function. Let's see. And as a, just a quick picture, whoop, I meant to do this. Uh, there are uh, different ways uh, that these initial conditions uh, and their types uh, project themselves onto the data. Uh, and when we actually look at the data, the picture that we get is more like this adiabatic one than other alternatives, okay? So I, I won't talk in any detail about what all these other alternatives are, uh, but the data turn out to match very well uh, the uh, uh, adiabatic uh, 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 approximation that we're making. They're close to adiabatic, and other things are perturbations on that adiabaticity, okay? So it's, uh, uh, we're jumping to the assumption, but that uh, assumption uh, turns out to match the data well. It also is a good approximation for single field inflation. Uh, these other things like isocurvature uh, come from sort of more complicated models of inflation. Okay, so now, what this essentially means is that all the stuff fluctuates together, which we can encode in the following statement that 
a perturbation in the energy density of some species A, which depends on both the uh, conformal time tau uh, and the uh, x position, can be equated with the average value of that quantity at some different time tau that depends on x. And this is the same for every single species uh, that we consider. And we have to subtract, of course, the uh, uh, average value at tau. OK? And so, uh, so now we can write this out. We can just Taylor expand in small fluctuations. So this is just rho bar a dot times the fluctuation which is encoded in uh, sort of this uh, uh, time lapse function. So let's draw a picture uh, of what this uh, actually looks like. So I could envision a picture like this where with time tau I get something like this. Uh, and now if I look at surfaces of constant delta rho A, they might look like this at uh, uh, various times t. That is, there is some fluctuation that uh, if I look at the perturbation at different uh, uh, positions here, all I have to do uh, to uh, yeah, sort of flatten this out is do a time reparameterization. I have to uh, uh, shift what I call the time variable. And if I shift what I call the time variable, then I can actually remove this perturbation uh, completely with the cost that whenever I do a uh, shift in the time variable, I have the cost of changing uh, the metric, right? So I do a coordinate shift, and so the metric will change uh, after I perform that coordinate shift. So adiabatic means that all the species fluctuate uh, in the same way with only uh, one function encoding the fluctuations of all of the species, okay? So now, we can remove the fluctuation from the energy densities and put them in the metric. OK? And so uh, uh, what this you know, roughly means, if all the fluids are uh, doing the, the same thing, then there's not a bunch of different fluctuations corresponding to uh, every different fluid, that they uh, 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 all sort of work in sequence to uh, give you a simpler kind of perturbation that can uh, uh, allow us to fix the gauge where in my new time variable, so maybe we call this tau prime, and now uh, with respect to our new time variable tau, everything just looks like this, okay? In terms of the delta rows, and each of these are just different values of the average row as I move through, as I move through time, okay? So now, uh, uh, once I uh, do this uh, reparameterization, I need to write you know, what the metric looks like after that reparameterization. And the spatial part of the metric, for example, will look like the following, where I have a squared of tau and if we're talking about the initial conditions here, then we would like to actually put the, th the uh, symbols that we've been using to describe the initial conditions in here. 
So we have minus 2 zeta of tau and x. Okay. So now all of the matter fluctuations and uh, energy fluctuations have been put into the metric tensor. Okay. And rather nicely, if you work out uh, the equations of motion for these uh, perturbations, say during uh, uh, inflation, they uh, uh, obey the nice property that when uh, the, uh, the uh, perturbation is produced and then inflation uh, stretches out that perturbation, then eventually the wavelength of that perturbation is going to exceed the Hubble radius during inflation, okay? And now you ask, okay, well, what is the evolution uh, of the perturbation once it's gone uh, super Hubble? And uh, the way that we've uh, parametrized uh, the perturbation is such that C is, CK is frozen. That is, it doesn't evolve uh, whatsoever when you solve the wave equation for this thing in the inflationary background. When it's uh, wavelength is roughly the inverse Hubble during inflation. Okay? So we presume adiabatic perturbations, and then we can go to a gauge where all of those perturbations are encoded in the metric, and then when those perturbations go outside the horizon, they're effectively just frozen in time. So now we can ask what happens after uh, inflation. When inflation is done, we exit uh, this uh, rapid expansion of the universe, and the Hubble radius starts to get bigger. Okay? And that means that these modes, which were uh, frozen when the, the Hubble uh, radius was smaller, are now inside uh, of the horizon. And then once they're inside the horizon, it's only then uh, when they start to uh, evolve again. Okay, so uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the distribution uh, of these uh, perturbations. We won't say uh, what their uh, origin is yet, but we just want a way to characterize uh, the distribution of these perturbations. And actually, what we want to get is uh, uh, the simplest characterization of them that turns out to correspond uh, to this way of looking at uh, the CMB data. OK. We call it in the last lecture, we uh, defined some probability distribution or we use, anyway, some probability distribution uh, uh, for these zetas to give us the correlators of the zetas. And that is the correlation of the zetas is in tight, is equal to the integral over all of the zetas with different k over the probability distribution. Oh, sorry. I, was, uh, I meant to work in position space right now. We can do this in either position or momentum space. Okay. 
Now there is a uh, particularly simple distribution that we can consider, uh, and that's the Gaussian distribution. And this also turns out to be a, a good uh, approximation for the data that we see. And so uh, for the moment, we will uh, presume that we're only uh, thinking about uh, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian distributed perturbations, okay? And if they are Gaussian, then that means that no matter what correlator uh, I consider, it can be expressed in terms of only the two-point function. That's what Gaussian means. The two-point function determines all of the various correlators uh, that you might be able to write down. The two-point function gives everything. So let's just write down the two-point function. zeta of x1, zeta of x2, and this is some function c given the distribution of zeta, that's the two worst uh, letters to write on the board, and further, if our uh, distribution obeys on average, statistically, homogeneity and isotropy, then we know that this can be re-expressed as a function only of the difference between x and x prime, okay? So if uh, on average the universe is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, that's what will go into this two-point function, okay? And this makes the Fourier transform of this thing particularly simple to write down. So if we consider the two-point function, zeta of k and k prime, then we should probably put a star here, then this could be expressed as 2 pi squared over k cubed of a function only of the magnitude of k times delta of k minus k prime, the Dirac delta function, okay? And so uh, what we've done is now uh, reduced this distribution. There's too many p's. Let's make this one uh, sort of a capital looking p with a little bar underneath it. Now we have uh, a, a p describing the two-point function as uh, the magnitude of k, where well, this is the magnitude of either one. We've got a delta function here, right? So you just pick k. And we call this the dimensionless power spectrum. Okay? But that is not what we see here, right? This is uh, the power spectrum only of the initial conditions, right? So we have this part 
of uh, the picture over here, but what we want to do is go from some initial uh, dimensionless power spectrum of the initial conditions and be able to map them onto uh, the correlators associated with the cosmic microwave background radiation that we observe. So, so now uh, the, most of the rest of what we're talking about today is going to see how we get from this to this, all right? One of the power spectra that, uh, uh, again, an approximation to uh, most models of inflation that you uh, uh, will get out is that this power spectrum is pretty independent of K, right? It's uh, what we call a scale invariant power spectrum. where this dimensionless power spectrum is just a constant, okay? So uh, uh, how does this uh, uh, intuitively uh, map on uh, to the picture of slow roll inflation? Let's imagine during inflation that the Hubble rate is constant, right? So we do this uh, slow roll picture, yes, where phi sort of rolls down uh, this picture, but the Hubble rate is set by uh, the amount of energy stored in the potential of this field, which, as I proceed from the beginning to the end uh, of inflation, doesn't change a whole lot from beginning to end, okay? Uh, and this means that this picture we were talking about uh, before, when I produce a quantum fluctuation, it gets stretched out outside the horizon, right? And then later uh, comes back in. If during inflation the horizon is always at the same size, then this procedure of produce fluctuation, stretch it out, go outside the horizon, is the same all the time during the process uh, of inflation. So that means because the modes are frozen when they come out, every single uh, wave number looked the same when it went outside. So when it comes back in, it should look the same until it goes through some procedure of evolution due to what's going on in the cosmology at the time when it re-enters, okay? So a good approximation is a approximately scale invariant power spectrum. So what we're gonna do today to just sort of get maybe some of the crude features that show up uh, in this picture here is make the assumption of a roughly constant uh, uh, power spectrum and see how from something that's flat and boring maps onto something with all of these interesting features, sort of flatness followed by some oscillations, followed by an exponential damping uh, of the power in the different uh, uh, coefficients that we associate with the harmonic expansion uh, of this thing, a mapping of this thing onto uh, 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 harmonics. What, why, it's, uh, why it's approximately constant. If this is slow roll, the potential here is almost the same as the potential here. It's the value of the potential that sets the Hubble rate, which sets the Hubble radius. And so if, I, if this uh, procedure of quantum fluctuate stretch is the same uh, during inflation at all times, then uh, the, 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 when the modes are frozen outside, the wave number that was produced earlier and got stretched out to a very big wavelength uh, is going to be the same as one that was produced later, but didn't get stretched as much during inflation, okay? So there's sort of a mode that maybe exits the horizon here and a mode that exits the horizon here, but the two different values of sort of the effective cosmological constant during that period of inflation are almost the same. So that means the Hubble radius didn't change, uh, you know, very much during the time that between the mode was produced stretched uh, and uh, uh, came and then you know eventually comes back in once this whole process finishes okay good yep right so if we don't assume the Gaussian approximation then there are uh, other features that are not captured in 
This picture here, uh, which is only uh, the power spectrum according to the two-point function. There are other uh, observables that you can look at, other ways of parsing this data uh, that give access to the uh, other moments of uh, these, uh, uh, these correlators, right? The other moments, I'm sorry, this, the other moments of this probability distribution. So those would, you would call non-Gaussianities uh, in the power spectrum. And so uh, uh, that's not encoded in this, which only looks at the two-point function. So let's figure out how to start making this connection between initial conditions which we will assume to be scale invariant in evolution, which is going to break this scale invariance and start to imprint features of that breaking of scale invariance onto the spectrum. But if it's just the standard model sitting around, we know how to predict uh, what those violations of scale invariance will look like and what sort of features they'll produce. And then finally, on to the things that we actually observe, okay? Which are the temperature fluctuations. So now let's talk about the anisotropies of the CMB. There's uh, one anisotropy that is not due to any uh, fancy stuff, uh, you know, going on in the early universe. It's just the fact uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, moving relative uh, to the co-moving frame. And so uh, if we draw a uh, picture of what our motion looks like relative uh, to the CMB, here we sort of draw the CMB as a circle surrounding us, or a sphere really. We have some velocity v relative uh, to the co-moving frame. And this is going to make it look hot on this side and cold on this side just due to a Doppler effect, yes? So if we look in some direction, and we look at, uh, you know, delta t over t, there's going to be a, a dipole contribution. So even if this was completely smooth, right, even if there were no uh, 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 fundamental delta t over t's, then we would get a uh, dipole that looks like this, which as a function of choosing uh, different directions to look is just our velocity times cosine of theta, where this is the angle theta, okay? Uh, this is kind of cool, because then you can fit the dipole, and you can figure out how fast we're moving. And it turns out to be 368 kilometers per second. Okay. And so when we look at that map, the pretty picture, it is the case that we have subtracted the dipole already. The dipole is gone. Okay. So the primordial anisotropy is the CMB with the dipole uh, having been subtracted. All right. So now. Uh, Let's ask the question of what happens uh, to a, a photon from uh, the moment of recombination, that surface of last scattering, uh, and the time uh, when it reaches us. So we imagine we have some surface of last scattering. So this is uh, uh, that, that uh, moment of uh, recombination. Here we are. Here's us. And 
there's a photon that came from that surface of last scattering and is making its way uh, towards us. Now this uh, photon is going to go on a little bit of a roller coaster ride because there are all kinds of inhomogeneities on the way that are uh, the remnants of these perturbations having evolved into uh, uh, you know, different kinds of structure and uh, uh, which we can just represent as a bunch of gravity wells. Let's just call them gravity perturbations. Okay, and so we want to characterize uh, these perturbations. So let's characterize them in terms of a uh, metric that encodes those fluctuations. So we have two functions that are related to each other. So here we have a, uh, a perturbation in the metric, and then we have a perturbation associated with the spatial part. Yeah, some reason the chalk doesn't write very well on certain parts of the board, I'm not sure why. So we have a phi and we have a psi. And these are related to each other uh, by solving Einstein's equations. And for many of the situations that uh, we're interested in, these are actually e approximately equal to each other. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, any absence of equality uh, between these uh, is referred to as anisotro anisotropic stress. So in the absence of anisotropic stress, these two functions are about equal to each other. So now what we want to do is figure out how these fluctuations between this point and this point affect the travel of this photon. So just like we did last time, uh, we have to solve the geodesic uh, equation for the photon traveling freely from this point until this point. But now we need to solve it with not just a uh, background expansion of the universe, but taking into account the fact uh, that the uh, universe is not just the background, but is a background plus some uh, perturbations. And I will not go through the derivation. I will simply write the answer. And the answer is that we write down d by d tau of the log of A times the photon momentum then this is equal to minus d phi by d tau plus the partial derivative with respect to tau of the sum of phi and psi. Okay. And what's nice is that this is almost integrable, right? Except for this piece here, we can just take the integral on both sides with respect to tau uh, and get a nice answer uh, for what happens to the photon momentum between uh, the early time, or the surface of last scattering time, time of last scattering, and when it reaches us, okay? So what is the result uh, when we integrate it? It's just that the log of a times p, where we are now, so at our time when we observe it, 
divided by A times P at this time of last scattering or surface of last scattering is equal to just the difference between phi naught and phi star. So it depends only on the value of the metric perturbation where we are. That's just one value. We're in one spot at uh, roughly one time, yes? Uh, so this is just a constant. And the value of uh, the metric perturbation at various places on this surface of last scattering, OK? And then we have to add the remaining term, that integral over d tau of only the partial derivative of phi plus phi, OK? So these terms uh, have uh, uh, different names associated with them. Maybe I, I sort of turn the crank a little bit before we write that out. So we can uh, relate this difference in momentum uh, to a difference in temperature just from the fact that A times P is approximately A times the uh, average temperature at that point times 1 plus a fluctuation in the temperature. And then plugging this in to this log, we can simply Taylor expand uh, in the fluctuation uh, to write a temperature fluctuation at the surface of last scattering to the temperature fluctuation that we actually see. And so if you turn that crank, the delta T over T uh, that we observe is related to delta T over T at the surface of last scattering plus phi star minus phi naught. We can write this maybe as a function of n, the direction that we are uh, looking at on the sky, minus that sort of monopole, that constant in the equation, plus this last piece. OK. Now finally, we can relate these delta t's. We want to relate these now to the uh, perturbations that were going on in the fluid around the time of last scattering which are things like the uh, uh, change in energy density uh, of the uh, photon relative to the background. And so we can write this using the relationship uh, between T and the momentum of the photon will be 1 quarter times delta gamma, where delta gamma is delta rho gamma over rho gamma, OK? And we will organize these things in a nice way. OK. So now we have a map. Uh, between the temperature uh, fluctuations that we observe, fluctuations evaluated at the time of last scattering, and some nasty integral uh, that we might have to do. Okay. Now these uh, different terms, and I, now we've dropped the monopole here. 
This is just an overall shift uh, in the temperature of all the photons. It only depends on uh, the perturbation where we are. So it'll be the same no matter what. So we can just leave it out. That's part of the average temperature so far as we're concerned. So we drop this and we're left uh, with uh, these terms where the first is referred to as the Sachs Wolf term, and then this one is referred to as the integrated Sachs Wolf term. So now what we have is part of the map. We have the map between what happened between here and here. Yes? We haven't figured out what this delta gamma is at the time. That happened sometime before this, but we have part of our map, all right? So we've developed uh, from this time to this time. There's one more term that we should add that we haven't taken into account. And this is due to the fact that at that surface of last scattering, the photon actually scatters off of something, and that something is not at rest, right? So you have a uh, velocity field uh, of electrons that the uh, uh, gammas are Thomson scattering off of, and the velocity of those electrons at that time of last scattering slightly Doppler shifts the photons relative to what we might evaluate from integrating over the physics between earlier times and this time of last scattering. So there's sort of one last kick that the photon gets. So here's just a picture of that. Uh, here's that surface of uh, last scattering on the black circle surrounding. There's a, a, a photon that is about to free stream. It scatters its last time off of that electron that's moving with some uh, velocity VE. And that gives the photon a kick, changing its momentum slightly from what you might have uh, predicted if you ignored this effect. And so we add one term. This guy, maybe I won't write the whole thing out. Let's just add it over here because it takes time for me to write things. Uh, so we add n dot ve, which takes into account this uh, Doppler shift effect. OK. Uh, and so uh, uh, what this uh, leads to is an effect on uh, the uh, 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 photons that we see where these different terms in this equation, if you consider them sort of one by one, lead to uh, an overall shift uh, in the uh, CMB. So if you take uh, into account, for example, the sachs wolf term, it gives you this red guy here. Uh, if you take into account the Doppler, it gives this guy here. The uh, integrated sachs wolf which is this, uh, that uh, uh, nasty integral that we didn't want to do, is down here. So we see that it's much smaller than the other things. And so for our purposes, for the rest of this lecture, we'll ignore that part. If you really want to get all the details of you know, how this works out, you have to include this. But we will leave it out uh, for the rest of the discussion, again, to get just the main ideas of what physics goes into uh, the, 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 the peaks and, and features in the CMB. So how do we characterize uh, this spectrum? I keep on showing this, this plot with L's and stuff. Let's actually uh, write down uh, what this plot means, what its axes are. The idea is that we are looking at different parts of the sky. And uh, there's 
mainly only one thing showing up in the game here if we assume a, a homogeneity and isotropy, and that is the angle between uh, the two points of the sky that we're measuring uh, the temperature at. And then what we do is we uh, average over all of the different uh, directions that we might look, keeping that angle fixed, okay? And that gives us an average value of delta t over t, uh, uh, the, the correlator between this at different points, uh, for all the different regions on the sky, right? So we do statistics on uh, the picture that we get there, calculating the average value of delta t n and delta t n prime and because uh, we're averaging, keeping uh, uh, cos theta fixed, the right-hand side is just going to be some function of cosine of theta, okay? So the average here is over the entire sky. So now what we can do is we can expand this uh, in Legendre polynomials. Where there are some coefficients CL multiplying a given Legendre polynomial. So when we write down the CMB in this format, we're looking at the CLs, the value of the CLs as a function of L uh, going off to the right. Okay? So this is literally the same picture that we looked at before, uh, but just uh, digested and churned into a set of uh, coefficients in this expansion. The CL is slightly different than this, up to a factor of L and L plus one, but it's roughly the same thing. This is the rescaled power spectrum. Okay, but roughly, you can think that they're the same as these CLs, or contain, they contain the same exact information. Okay? Um, and so again, for, for Gaussian fluctuations, this should be all there is. If there's only Gaussian fluctuations, this is all we need to take into account. This has all the information uh, we need uh, to contain everything that's in the pretty picture. Yes? So we don't need to do delta t, delta t, delta t. We expect that that'll vanish. They don't vanish completely, but they are small. So now what we want to do is figure out what are the theory predictions uh, for these CLs. It's going to be related to this effect right here that uh, uh, takes some set of uh, initial conditions and transforms them into uh, the uh, uh, we read off on the night sky. So the CLs, I mean, we all, uh, this is sort of textbook. You need to, you know, take this thing and you, uh, uh, you know, integrate over an orthonormal set of functions and you, know, you read off the, the coefficients, okay? That process can be digested into an expression looking like this. times something that encodes the initial conditions that we started with, where this is called uh, the transfer function, okay? And now it's the transfer function that's going to encode, uh, you know, mapping, uh, you know, that uh, integral over uh, orthonormal functions. And we can write these TLs as 
transfer functions associated with particular effects that we have in this relation here, say one associated with the Sachs-Wolf effect, and then myster somewhat mysteriously there are these Bessel functions appearing where this is the distance to the surface of last scattering. And I should make myself more room. Plus a term due to the uh, Doppler effect that encodes uh, the effect of that last scattering off of the, uh, the electron. So we have uh, T D of K, and then it turns out to be the derivative of the Bessel function evaluated at KR star. So now I won't derive exactly you know, how you get uh, uh, this form, but the rough idea is that uh, we have uh, uh, two bases that we're using, right? We're using the Fourier basis for plane waves uh, to describe the initial conditions the zetas, which I don't seem to have written anymore, those were written in uh, a plane wave basis. Uh, but now we're looking at a, a spherical basis, right? So we have to map uh, between the spherical basis of waves and uh, the plane waves. And the appearance of these Bessel functions uh, is precisely due to that uh, mapping, OK? Okay, so now what we want to do uh, is figure out, you know, what these uh, uh, T's are. And they have to do with the evolution of the very initial conditions onto the conditions as they uh, were at the surface of last scattering. Let's see, so we have and we'll work through, uh, uh, we'll, we'll dig in a little bit more and we'll get a little bit of a better sense of what this uh, transfer function is doing. Delta gamma and let's label these by wave number k. So we've now decomposed these fluctuations into uh, momentum modes. And what we do is we divide this by the actual initial condition that we started with, this zeta k, right? So there's some way that we map very early initial conditions before the time of last scattering, that is those fluctuations that re-enter the horizon. Then they re-enter the horizon, they start to evolve and do stuff. And this is just the ratio between what happened uh, to the stuff, what it evolved into uh, between that early time and the time of last scattering. You want to evaluate this at the time of last scattering and that initial condition, okay? So this is just something that relates where we started to where we ended up. Where we started, where we ended up. Remember that this is the important figure of merit because what we see where we are to a good approximation only depended on what things looked like at the surface of last scattering. That was sort of the beauty of this thing uh, being uh, almost a total derivative, okay? So secretly there was all this stuff between the surface of last scattering and here, but the only thing that it really mattered was what happened at that surface of last scattering up to these Corrections that are very important if you really want to get the super right answer, but not so important if we want to get a feel for what's going on. And then there's a T Doppler. That is just minus VE of K divided by, again, the initial condition. Okay. And as we'll see, 
the directionality dependence, the left-hand side only depends on the magnitude, but here there's directionality. Uh, that'll cancel out when we do this mapping uh, onto initial conditions. So this thing really only does depend on the magnitude of the momentum. So even though these are Bessel functions, if we were to actually do this integral here, they still kind of act almost like delta functions. Uh, so we can get kind of an approximate result for this integral uh, in certain cases. J's act like deltas. That fits there nicely. Uh, and so uh, uh, if you look at what the J squareds look like, and I look at a particular uh, value of, let's see, we have their uh, arguments are the um, KR star. Okay and we look at kr star about equal to l, then these jls look like this with some oscillations after this, okay? So they're almost like delta functions uh, peaked at uh, l. And so uh, what this means is that these deltas, these approximate delta functions, basically set k equal to l over r star. Is there a question or was that just the sound of the car? Okay, nobody said anything. All right. And so when you do this integral, you can roughly see that the CLs, using this very crude approximation, but good enough for our purposes. We have that maybe a constant uh, uh, distribution function here, the scale invariant power spectrum appearing. And then we have two contributions. T Sachs Wolf squared L over R star plus T Doppler squared of L over R star. The J times the J prime doesn't have this feature. The J prime squared does. Uh, and so you don't really get uh, an, uh, uh, a contribution from the cross term here when you square this, OK? So you can ignore that piece. It's pretty small. OK. So. Now we've got kind of everything we need uh, to, in principle, map the early physics onto the late physics appearing in the CLs in these kinds of plots. So let's, let's maybe take a break and ask, are there, are there any questions? We've gone through a lot. Uh, what we're just trying to do is, again, sketch the rough map between how we get from a set of uh, early initial conditions into uh, uh, the temperature anisotropies that we see. Uh, you're probably going to answer this uh, anyway. But um, in the plot you had of the different contribution, it looked like whenever there was a maximum in the Sachs Wolf, there was a minimum in the Doppler, and vice versa. Or yeah, almost. I guess it's like the, probably the J and the J prime or something like this. Okay. Uh, they'll probably peak at different places or something. That's I my see. guess, but yeah. But there is no obvious physical meaning to this? Um, yeah, I don't have a strong intuition uh, uh, right off the bat. Why would they be out of phase with each other? Uh, I'll think about it. Maybe I uh, come up with the answer for tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, why is it J and J? So, so the, I guess the question, the answer will be in the detailed derivation uh, of uh, this form here. Uh, and so you can go ahead and, and read that. I didn't read it through it's in, in its entirety before preparing the lecture, but it is uh, in uh, uh, 
either Daniel Bauman's notes or in uh, his uh, advanced cosmology book, which is free, by the way, if you want to go download it from his Dropbox. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, so now what we want to do is uh, we want to trace the uh, evolution of perturbations from when they are first re-entering the horizon until that surface of last scattering. We want to get at, for example, uh, this piece right here, right? Uh, if we calculate this piece right here, given this, we can calculate that ratio and we can stick it into this formula and that'll give us uh, uh, an expectation for what to get at that value of L. Yes, that's our idea, that's our, our procedure here. So let's move on and talk about acoustic, was there a question? Oh, no. good, okay. <laughs> This P here, yeah, that's the probability distribution over the initial conditions, right? So we have the initial conditions, and then we have a map between initial conditions uh, and uh, the surface of last scattering. And so this thing, uh, you know, combined together, sort of folded together, uh, uh, gives us the CL that we will read off by looking at the sky. Very good. Yes? Uh, uh, not directly, uh, right? We don't have, uh, we have theoretical access. We can cook up a model uh, and work out what those initial conditions are given, say, that in particular inflationary model. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is sort of allowing us to get access to the initial conditions, right? So we uh, uh, have a set of physics that we understand and we're going to talk about. So we're gonna be able to sort of fold back time, go from what we see now to what happened at the surface of last scattering, to when those modes uh, uh, re-entered the horizon. And when those modes re-entered the horizon, remember they were frozen before, and so uh, uh, the way that they were distributed here uh, is going to depend on that model of inflation that you had that produced those uh, uh, perturbations, those initial conditions, right? So this, this is giving us access to the initial conditions uh, uh, given the physics of everything that intervened and the physics that produced it. If we assume that it's just standard model, then it gives us direct access to the initial conditions. If it's the standard model plus X, then you know, this uh, uh, is going to have effects on it from that new physics. And so uh, uh, you know, same initial conditions will give us different final answers if there's other intervening physics going on, right? So there's two places it can happen. It can happen in the evolution or in the initial conditions. And so you can't disambiguate completely between whether some feature that you observe that is not standard model-like happened in the initial conditions or in the intervening epoch necessarily, right? Okay, good. So uh, any other questions? Yeah. Which, yeah. which integral? So this is the Sachs-Wolf term, which is only this piece. There is, in principle, this piece, but we see it's kind of phenomenologically small, and so right now we're leaving it off. It is there. There is some plus T I S W times some other combination of Bessel functions, some other thing with the Bessel functions. I don't know what it's going to look like that will be, in principle, in this piece. So it is there, in principle. I just have ignored it at this point. All right, so uh, uh, before that time of last scattering, I have a plasma uh, of uh, electrons uh, and protons and photons. And uh, these are actually usually called the baryon acoustic oscillations. 
So uh, a thing that I didn't know uh, before uh, digging into this is that cosmologists call these things baryons. Uh, and uh, they also uh, say that uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions are strongly, uh, uh, strongly interacting, which really confused me uh, that the first time I was introduced uh, to this uh, years ago. So they're in plasma, and they are strongly interacting. which uh, I, I uh, in, uh, interpret just means uh, you can't neglect their interactions, okay? So they're not so small that you can't ignore them. Uh, okay, so, so with that, just a semantic uh, uh, clarification. Uh, uh, we talk about the baryon acoustic oscillations as uh, oscillations uh, in this plasma. So there is a uh, sound speed in this plasma that is an important figure of merit for the rest of our discussion. And the sound speed uh, in this plasma is going to depend on how many baryons there uh, are in the plasma as expressed as a fraction of uh, how much of the density is there in uh, photons. And I think I'll assign as a, uh, a homework problem the relationship between the sound speed and these uh, fractional densities. So here R is defined as the ratio of the energy density in baryons to the energy density in uh, photons. And so there are two epochs, uh, roughly. Remember that uh, from there we have very early times when we were radiation dominated, uh, and then uh, we had uh, uh, the moment of matter radiation equality, and after that point, uh, we are matter dominated. And so in this plasma that's there uh, before uh, recombination, there are different epochs where the sound speed will start at uh, 1 over square root of 3, but then once the baryons uh, start to take over uh, the plasma, the sound speed will start to drop uh, precipitously as the baryons start to overwhelm uh, the photon densities, okay? So, so the sound speed will evolve. Oh, sorry, there's a three, there's a three quarters here in the, in the definition, sorry. Okay. Um, and so now these sound waves in this plasma are sourced by those initial conditions. They're sourced by those initial perturbations. Okay, so I meant to put up this picture here, uh, where there's a sort of a picture of what, kind of what are the kinds of interactions happening in this uh, plasma. So there's uh, an interaction between the baryons, the electrons, and the uh, protons. They're undergoing uh, Coulomb scattering uh, off of each other. And then uh, the photons are Thomson scattering uh, off of the electrons. That's actually your other homework problem, answering why don't uh, the photons uh, uh, Thompson scatter off of the protons. It's a nice little quick dimensional analysis uh, problem working out the cross sections. And I'll write those. I, by the way, did uh, the uh, uh, homework problems make it onto the website? I hadn't checked yet. I sent them to Humberto uh, last night. Did anybody check or see them? OK, I'll, I'll email again and uh, uh, make sure they, they get up there. My apologies. OK, so yes, so the sound waves are sourced uh, by those uh, initial uh, inhomogeneities. 
So what we want to do now is work out uh, what the wave equation is for sound waves in this plasma. All right, and so I'm going to just write down this master equation that relates perturbations in the photon energy density to perturbations in the metric. Remember, these are the way we wrote down our metric fluctuations, phi and psi. And then there's a psi dot. OK. Uh, and the idea is that we can calculate these using the Einstein equations. And we can get these in terms of uh, what's going on uh, with the radiation and the matter. And so we'll get uh, some complicated equation relating uh, the energy densities uh, to themselves that is roughly a wave equation. Okay? And this is very difficult uh, to do in, uh, in practice. Uh, you what you would typically do is numerically uh, uh, you know, compute uh, the answer to this differential equation, and then you know map it on to some initial condition. Yes. Uh, so this comes from combining uh, the continuity uh, equation for uh, the perturbations uh, and uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Euler equations for the fluid. Just fluid yes, it's just fluid dynamics. Yep. So to get a basic idea of what to expect, we can think about looking at this equation in different regimes. So if we think about the uh, epoch of radiation domination, this R is tiny, right? Gammas are dominating, R is zero. So in this case, if R is zero, we can leave off this term, we can leave off this term, and further if we uh, presume, as we were uh, saying before, there's a lack of anisotropic stress, that is that phi and psi are equal, then we can uh, reorganize this equation into a nice oscillator equation where I consider the combination 1 quarter delta gamma plus phi, no minus. And uh, with this combination, after I reorganize this, I get that theta double dot minus one third del squared theta is zero. Just a nice, simple wave equation uh, for 
very happily exactly the combination that appears uh, in that sachs wolf term, right? The one quarter delta gamma uh, minus phi. And so we can solve this. So for a uh, particular Fourier mode uh, of uh, theta, we have that theta tilde is just sines and cosines. The sound speed, k tau, all right. So now we're almost to an answer for the transfer function, except that we have not yet determined uh, the coefficients a and b, OK? So these need to be uh, mapped onto uh, initial conditions. For adiabatic initial conditions where everything is determined uh, by that uh, mode that froze out and then uh, re-entered uh, the horizon, this BK is equal to zero. And further, you can map uh, AK onto the the zeta that appeared in the metric, remember we wrote gamma ij is a squared e to the minus 2, minus 2 zeta here, OK? Delta ij. In the mapping uh, between uh, zeta and the perturbation of phi and gamma, when you take into account this adiabatic condition, AK is just 3 times zeta of K. So now we've completed the picture uh, for a simplified case where I ignore uh, the baryons completely, and we can calculate the sachs wolf transfer function. So this is just theta of k divided by zeta of k. And so this is just an evaluated at the surface of last scattering. And so this is just 3. The zetas drop out uh, once you've imposed the initial conditions. And uh, we have 3 times the cosine of C, S, K, tau, star, OK? And so what we have here now is something that is oscillating as a function of the wave number that you input into it, right? If I hold, you know, tau star is the time of last scattering, right? So that's fixed, right? But I'm varying uh, the wave number k uh, for all the different uh, sound waves that are produced in this picture, OK? And so this means that as I look at different values of k, I'm going to get different power uh, for those values of k, yes? What you're effectively doing is at that surface of last scattering, you're catching uh, those oscillations either uh, you know, at their uh, high point or their low point or in their midpoint, right? Uh, and so uh, that's encoded in this uh, transfer function.
And so this will produce oscillations in the power spectrum. We have to relate this now to the L's, but remember uh, the J's do precisely that, right? Okay. And I've got about five minutes left, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So T Sachs Wolf squared, just taking into account we're not doing the Doppler, we're just doing the Sachs Wolf. The Sachs Wolf looks like it's peaking at, of course, where this is equal to some uh, integer multiple of pi. We're looking at the square, of course. So that's where uh, uh, this thing is going to have the most uh, power. And we can now uh, relate uh, uh, K star to the time of last scattering. Oh, sorry, I didn't do the next part. So now this gives, this means that there are going to be sort of uh, special values of K equal to n pi over uh, Cs tau star or n times k star. So this is sort of like a, a fundamental wave number in which these peaks come in integer uh, multiples. And so now, what does this look like uh, in terms of a mapping onto the sky? This is actual angular theta as uh, we're looking out. There's going to be sort of a, uh, a fundamental uh, uh, unit of angle on the sky that is related uh, to this uh, fundamental wave number approximately. We have to relate this uh, to uh, our angular distance uh, to that point on the sky. We're far away from it. And you can think about this as a fundamental wavelength divided by dA, the angular diameter distance. And now, finally, we can relate this theta star to an L star, that is the L's that appear uh, in this expansion in the uh, uh, polynomials. And uh, the angular distance in, so long as our spatial curvature is zero, which we're presuming it is, is just C times tau, the time between last scattering uh, and uh, where we are now. Okay, so this will just be that square root of uh, uh, 3 pi that comes from the sound speed being uh, the 1 over the square root of 3 times our current time divided by the time at last scattering. Okay. So the tau star comes from the k, the tau naught comes from our distance to the surface of last scattering. We can neglect tau star because that was very, very, very small compared to our current time. Yes, so we just drop that out. Okay, so now we know that after a recombination, everything was matter dominated. So that means we can figure out a relationship uh, between tau, this ratio of taus, and the redshift uh, at the point of recombination. And so we can re-express this as 
has L star equals tau naught over tau star. We're just writing the same thing again. Whoops, not under the square root. Uh, and A, if you solve the Friedman equations for matter domination, goes like tau squared. And so this is the square root of A naught divided by A at the time of recombination. But this is nothing but the approximate redshift at that point. So this should be the square root of 1 over 1,100 times the square root of 3 times pi, which if you crunch the numbers, uh, turns out to be approximately 200, OK? So the relative uh, peaks and troughs from the acoustic oscillations should peak at integer multiples of this sort of fundamental L number, where that fundamental L number is 200. And indeed, if you Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Tau, tau naught over tau star. Thank you. Yeah, A naught is a lot bigger than A star. Thank you. Very good. Yep. For, for what? Yes, yes. So, well, we assume radiation domination up until we're making the approximation that we're radiating dominated, radiation dominated all the way uh, to the point of recombination. So, we're, we're fudging and saying that uh, 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 you know, this equality uh, happened at recombination, not well before it. Okay? No, it wasn't well before it, but. Remember the transfer function, uh, uh, the, the Sachs Wolf effect, only depended on uh, the thing at the surface of last scattering. So we only need to evaluate the thing at the surface of last scattering. If you're doing the integrated Sachs, well, you need to be you know, more careful. Then it depends on all the intervening stuff. Uh, but for. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we're making a very crude approximation right now. And, and I'll tell you, I guess, tomorrow uh, uh, the details of what happens when you take into account you know, the, uh, the matter domination period that actually happens before recombination. So I guess I'll just end with the fact that if you sort of squint and look at this, uh, look at this picture, the peaks do indeed happen at uh, uh, roughly multiples of uh, L equals 200. So we have one sort of crude feature of what's showing up here. And uh, so I guess next time we'll talk a little bit about some of the other features associated with why it's flat early on. Uh, uh, this part is roughly kind of what we uh, talked about here, corresponding to uh, uh, modes that entered right during uh, uh, radiation domination. And then there's a uh, damping that happens due to the fact that uh, you know, this is, uh, there's, there's an effect due to matter domination uh, that affects uh, modes with higher wave number that are sensitive to the fact that, that speed of sound is starting to decrease uh, uh, later on in that, in that epoch. Okay, so I'll, I'll end there. Thanks, uh, and questions. Thank you. Uh, we already had quite some discussion. I mean, we are going to have the discussion in 15 minutes yeah, okay, on, good. Uh, with so, you in Java. So maybe yeah. shall we break for coffee now? And then when we come back, maybe you think about what questions to ask. And uh, Jay will be here in Java, I guess, as well, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, I don't know, I didn't and ask And we can do a generous so. 15 minutes, maybe, so you can refresh a bit. 